It's quite difficult when we look at Godard's very early films to separate them out from the other new wave directors. People like Truffaut, Rivette, Romer, they all looked as if they were very much of a, of a group. I think why Godard really um, stands out among that crowd, um, certainly from the mid to late 1960s onwards, is that he just retained this kind of ferocious interrogation of cinema, of the functioning of cinema, and of how cinema interacts with the world. So I think there was that combination of, on the one hand, curiosity, intellectual curiosity, but also just a really sharp, almost philosophical intelligence that was kind of fueling that interrogation. One of the things that's interesting about Godard is that his work is instantly recognisable. You can watch just a few seconds of a shot and there's something about the lighting, the framing, the way the person moves. There are very, very few filmmakers that have been able to achieve, you know, that degree of kind of signature to their work. Godard starts out as a critic and as a short filmmaker in the 1950s, breaks into feature filmmaking with Aboud Souf, Le Breathless, which is a massive international hit and basically sets him up for the rest of his career. And then that sort of first flourishing of his work, which is really in relation to Hollywood and fueled by a kind of cinephilic engagement with cinema history, continues from late 50s through to about 1965. What's so interesting about Alphaville is that you're immediately launched into this kind of weird and wonderful world of a kind of sci-fi adventure set in contemporary Paris. It's playful, but it's also deadly serious in its critique of the commodification of Paris. So I think it combines that engagement with Hollywood genre, but also a political critique of the nefarious effects of capitalism. I think it brings together those two things in an absolutely perfect way. I think it's very powerful, very playful, and very poetic. It's a beautiful film. And there there's a shift with Pierre Le Fou in particular, but then films such as Masculine et Féminin, Deux ou Trois Choses que je sais d'elle, where Godard's work takes on a more kind of sociological dimension. En 65. He's more interested in engaging uh, with society, with contemporary France, with pressing issues around consumerism and capitalism. And then that leads into the collaborative work that he uh, conducts with the Ziegobertov group from 1968 to 1972. From 1973, Godard moves out of Paris and moves first to Grenoble and then to Roll in Switzerland. And during that period, he's really interested in multimedia. And that period, which includes two massive TV series, runs to 1979. Then he returns to European art cinema with Sauve qui peut la vie in 1980. And then there's a period, there's a kind of cycle of films that are often thought of as the kind of the films of the sublime to do with beauty, where Godard is engaging again with uh, the history of painting, the history of music basically the history of kind of classical art and trying to recuperate that back into the history of cinema. And those films, they're all kind of fueled by this question of how to make images, what constitutes a poetic image in cinema that's both informed by but different from all those other art forms. The latter half of the 80s are characterised by a couple of quite difficult kind of philosophical films, King Lear and Swine Ta Droite. It's also the period where he begins to work extensively on Histoire du Cinéma, so his, his big videographic film history project that's going to dominate his work really over the decade from the mid to late 80s through to the end of the 1990s. 
when he'd completed Histoire du Cinéma, there was a kind of sense that he'd come to the end of, of a massive project. And I think many critics almost wrote him off and thought, oh, you know, he's kind of, he's now, that's it. As, as he often does when people think he's worked himself into a bit of a dead end, he came up with a completely new project, which was a gallery installation in, in 2006 at the Pompidou Centre. And then since then uh, has produced a string uh, of highly experimental features uh, alongside lots of video essays. Pu faire de nous les humbles. Qui ça? Ou pas su, ou pas voulu. If we look at a film like Adieu au Langage, his recent foray into 3D, it's been phenomenally successful with all audiences around the globe, both young, old, so, you know, sort of Godard veterans, but also those coming to his work for the first time. Cette matinée est un rêve. Chacun doit penser que le rêveur, c'est l'autre. Je ne dirai presque rien. Je cherche la pauvreté dans le langage. Deux. La violence, la violence, la violence, la rivolta. Very, very often, Godard's work gets rejected or it gets classified as being difficult or inaccessible or elitist or whatever when it comes out. But then, um, a decade later or a couple of decades later, it's reclassified as a classic and it actually becomes much more accessible. À quoi tu penses? Tu crois pas que Roland se méfie? Il me regarde drôlement quelquefois. I think that one of the things that became actually something of an obsession for Godard, particularly in the sort of late 70s and into the 80s, was what is uniquely cinematic? What is cinema in the sense of how do we put together certain elements in a way that isn't pre-planned to create something that is absolutely unique and that allows some kind of insight that comes directly out of the image and sound uh, rather than out of written or spoken language. Elle est actrice. Elle porte un chandail bleu nuit avec deux raies jaunes. Elle est d'origine russe. Ses cheveux son châtain foncé. Oui. Parler comme des citations de vérité. C'est le père Brecht qui disait ça. Que les acteurs doivent citer. Maintenant, elle tourne la tête à droite. Mais ça n'a pas d'importance. For God, our classical narrative is intrinsically tied up with capitalism. Si on prend des vedettes, on vous donnera de l'argent. Bon, alors il n'y a qu'à prendre des vedettes. Something that distinguishes him slightly from some of his colleagues at the time of the New Wave is that he was coming out of a deep engagement with and an awareness of political modernism. He was familiar with the experimental writings of people like Faulkner and Joyce and so on. That very literary sensibility and experimentation that was to fuel his uh, experimentation with, with narrative. Godard's relation to, to politics is, is fascinating and quite complex. There's one period, that is the period of the Zygovetov group, where he's basically aligning himself with a kind of Maoist political line. Everywhere else in his work, his politics is really, really difficult to, to read. And in all of his work, and a very good example of this is Le Petit Soldat, which was his second film that was banned because of its allusions to torture and to the Algerian war, where the politics were very, very unclear. What's characteristic of that film is that it just wound everybody up because it seemed to be, it, was, it wasn't at all um, obvious where he was positioning himself. I think what is interesting about that film in relation to his later work is that in his later work, very often there are conflicting political positions within a single work which are kind of yoked together um, and they're presented and they're presented as a problem or as a question. La vérité, le cinéma, c'est 24 fois la vérité par seconde. Looking again at, 
um, some of the Group Ziegewerter films or some of the political films. They're much more interesting than they're often given credit for. There's a film from 1968 called Un film comme les autres, a film like any other, where Godard basically kind of films students and workers in discussion about the implications of the events of May 1968, which is intercut with archival footage of the events that have gone on from May throughout the rest of May 68. And seeing it again recently, it just struck me that it gave an absolutely fantastic sort of historical glimpse into the mentality of that period, better really than any other film that I can think of. The key concerns that fuels Godard's work of that period is an attempt to find some kind of constructive dialogue between intellectuals and workers. As for Godard's representation of women, it's more complex and it's more interesting than is, is often uh, recognised. Ah, comme ça, je vois des endroits de toi que tu ne vois jamais. Toi, oui, mais moi. There's a time in the late 60s and then into the 70s where Godard starts engaging with feminist theory. This is probably through Anne-Marie Mirville. For example, in Numéro 2 in 1975, Germaine Greer, the female eunuch, is cited fairly extensively on the soundtrack. It's not as if Godard is unaware of his use of the naked female body in his films. British Sounds is quite a good example, because there we have a young naked woman, but where the text on the soundtrack, which is juxtaposed with the representation of that body, is basically one, it's a feminist text about the exploitation of women in society and the exploitation of the, of the image of women. Is founded. Is founded for limited, liberated areas. You give up struggling on every front and you ease into a niche of acceptance. You become the educated housewife with your cooking recipes or the image of a suffragette, which is a distorted image, <laughs> tweedy, sensitive. Of Godard's lesser known works, um, probably Six fois deux sur et sous la communication, which was a TV series from 1976 that Godard and Mierville made at very short notice and within a very... <laughs> That's just such a perfect Godardian interruption. <laughs> 